occupied of, we had suggested 200 euros per month, and that the revenue from this charge is collected and kept by local authorities until such time as the units are put into use. But the fact, mm -hmm. just to elaborate that fact, the yeah. fact that they're not currently coming mm -hmm. onto use, uh, there is obviously a blockage somewhere, Where, um, yeah. because the supply, the demand side is enormous, and have yes. you identified? No, I mean, if you look at the official uh, statistics which have come out, I think, from NAMA and various other agencies, they say there's, um, of the 668 unfinished developments, um, 447 of those have no active construction activity, um, that you have 2,300 of those units are still under construction, a huge number of them are vacant, these are the housing agency figures, yet there's no um, indication as to why it's taking so long. I mean, these are figures, the last figures are from 2014, 2015, yet there was 8.7 million given from the Special Resolution Funding Scheme to both complete them and refurbish them and make sure they could be occupied, yet it's unclear to me why it is taking so long for this to come on stream. Thank you. Uh, but I just say back on that, I think we disagree on what, uh, maybe I misunderstood you or maybe I didn't. Uh, you're talking about a tax penalty as opposed to an incentive. I suppose, we, we, yes, we have a difference. Yeah, no, no, I think yeah. there's a very significant difference there. And the question I want to ask you, uh, it, it would be far easier to bring reluctant uh, owners into the market uh, if there was an incentive as opposed to a penalty. And to me, if I just make the point, and I appreciate what you're saying, uh, I, I think that what we need to, the biggest problem we have at the moment is, one, is that some landlords don't want to take the HAP, right? Uh, secondly, if they do, uh, the tenant is restricted at this moment in time into a maximum two-year lease, where on the point of sale, or an alleged sale, uh, they're put out. So I think, I think if we could find a formula uh, where you would encourage them to give a longer period of time, say five years would be a reasonable period of time, with a fixed, you know, a fixed income to the landlord, a fixed, uh, a fixed tenancy to, to, to the tenant, uh, and to encourage that. Uh, I accept that if somebody is obviously you know, waiting for the market price to go up, which is obviously a use it or lose it uh, tax you're talking about in one sense, but I, I also think there are lots of, I think we need to offer uh, incentives as well, because I think they will actually work. Because the, you know, the, the, if the incentive is there, if I have a house, um, you know, the incentive is there that I can well, have a five-year deal, I know what I'm going to get, you know, and it's, it's, it's with the local authority and therefore they structure the house and the condition of it is guaranteed. I think that would work. Uh, I actually genuinely think so. But I think, to, to be fair, yes. you've made yeah. your point, yeah. and that's a matter that we will need to tease through in terms of formulating well, our I'm just, ask, I'm just asking the witnesses' opinion on that. Like, I suppose uh, in terms of... You know, an incentive, along with penalties, uh, you know, yeah, they I mean, they're, not necessarily, uh, they're not necessarily mutually sort of, exclusive. Yeah. If you were to introduce an incentive, then you would have to have some form of penalty if that incentive wasn't used. And I think what would be very important is the design of the incentive and having a sunset clause, because if this incentive is only supposed to run for a certain period of time, then yeah, but do you the have design and sunset clause. Would you have a problem with that? That's what I'm, if, the, if there was a sunset clause and if, it was, if, and if there were penalties also, what I'm trying to find is, is a consensus for a formula that, that you could support. There, there isn't a consensus. Oh, no, I'm, just, on a, I'm you know. just asking the witness, I'm not asking you. No, uh, well, you're trying to find a consensus on something there isn't a consensus no, on. No, I, I can, I can, Chairman, I'm not asking Deputy Coppinger for her views. I know them. She knows mine. I'm asking uh, the witness. In just terms yes. of uh, incentives I know she's not answering. or <laughs> penalties. I think what is required here is careful design and to ensure that the incentives don't further distort the market and you have to design them very carefully. There should be annual reviews if you do introduce incentives, I would say a review by this committee or whatever housing committee annually to ensure that it's having the correct impact. If it's not having the impact then it either has to be redesigned, there should be at a minimum a five year sunset clause and at the same time you should also have a levy on empty homes, we would say a monthly levy and also a levy on undeveloped land, which I know the government are introducing, I think, in 2018 or 2019, to ensure that that land is used. I think that's fair. That's, that's fair. That's Thank fair. you. Okay. Deputy O'Sullivan. Touch Michelle there, and the question I was going to ask, which is about the vacant sites. Yeah. 
and the levy. And I know I did ask the minister when he was in here, and he had various reasons that it could only be 3% and it couldn't come in on the advice of the Attorney General until 2019. And I was just, would like to get your opinion on that and what you would, have, would do, what Social Justice Ireland would have done, or what you can do in terms of the vacant sites. Well, what we had proposed last year is that local authorities should be empowered to collect uh, site value tax on underdeveloped land and that we would levy it at a rate of 2,000 2, euros per hectare or part thereof per annum to encourage landowners to utilise the land they use that they possess and to prevent speculation because until such time as you do that people will sit on the land banks until the price rises and I really don't I suppose it's unclear to me how what the difficulty is in was in implementing it this year, if it was announced in Budget 2016, I really find it difficult to understand that it couldn't have been implemented in 2016. Also, I find it difficult uh, to understand why the levy is just at 3%. Uh, I, I know the Minister may have given particular reasons for this, but I don't think the levy as it's designed, as it stands, will actually encourage people to use the land that they're sitting on. Okay. Is there anybody else? I have a question at this stage. Okay, just before we conclude, uh, will you go back to a point you made earlier on, and I know Deputy Coppinger followed up, but you might just explain it again to the, to the committee. You talked about removing, uh, moving from the differential rent to a cost rental base. Will you just explain your thinking on that again? Please? Well, we would see this uh, moving to a cost rental system. It was one of the NESC proposals in their um, document looking at housing. In Ireland, but we would see this um, a much more long-term goal because it would be impossible to implement a cost rental system until you have sufficient supply. So we would see uh, the initial objective is to get the hou sufficient housing stock, both social housing units and private housing units, and then to move to a cost rental system whereby the housing provider develops the accommodation and charges the rent on the basis of covering capital and maintenance costs only. Initially, obviously, this cost will be higher probably than what the differential rent is. However, if you look at um, research by thresholds, a huge number of rent supplements and HAP recipients are already paying a top-up particularly rent supplement recipients, and they also have very insecure uh, tenure. So as part of the cost rental system, it's not just removing the differential caps, caps. You have to be within a system where there is security of tenure, there is sufficient supply, there uh, are not just tax incentives for private landlords, and you would be looking at approved housing bodies managing some of these developments. But it is a much longer term goal. Um, and it would be moving towards a system which uh, NESC has outlined that not only should you be developing housing for occupancy, but the state should be able to ensure that we have a sufficient amount of housing available for long-term tenancy, and also that these units are suitable both for single-person family units and for older people or people with a disability. This is a much longer-term goal. It would require... Uh, consensus uh, around what sort of housing policy and housing strategy we have, but prior to even moving towards a cost rental system, you would need the supply. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes this section. Uh, Michelle, Ms, Ms Murphy, thank you very much for your presentation. The uh, written submission, as I said earlier, will be published on the website, and thank you for your answers to the questions. Uh, we'll suspend for just a couple of moments while the next witnesses come in. Resume in public session. Good afternoon. You're very welcome. Once again, to remind colleagues at the outset, if you have mobile phones, uh, if you wouldn't mind switching them off or to flight mode. And I just need to read the notice in relation to privilege for the witnesses. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. 
The opening statements submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting. And members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the Houses or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I'd like to thank the Peter McBerry Trust for uh, appearing this morning, represented by Father Peter McBerry, Mr Pat Doyle, uh, Brian Field and Francis Doherty. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, your submission has been made available to the members, um, but at this stage I think it's yourself, Mr Doyle, who's going to do a summary and an opening statement and then colleagues will have a number of questions for you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, deputies, for having us. I'm going to ask our National Director of Housing to read in the statement, if that's okay, Brian Friel. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the committee will be fully aware that there are in excess of 6,000 people in homelessness across Ireland, of whom 2,000 are children. In addition to the family homeless emergency, there are over 3,000 adults with no dependents in homeless services nationally. Individuals and indeed couples face enormous challenges in accessing housing. The people that Peter McFerry Trust supports can often be excluded by mainstream social housing providers. Inadequate housing provision and housing supports mean that it is single individuals who face the longest wait for housing and the greatest risk of damage and institutionalisation by the system. Despite the deepening emergency across Ireland, there are only five counties where there are more than 100 people in homelessness. However, the situation is shifting dramatically. For example, in Kildare, the numbers in homelessness has doubled since January the 1st. In Tipperary, the figure has gone from four individuals to 54 individuals in just three months. In Dublin, there are on average eight new adult presentations per day. So solutions. What can be done? What must be done? Firstly, there must be an emphasis on prevention. An obvious point that needs stressed is that the turning point in the fight against homelessness arrives when the number exiting homelessness exceeds the number entering homelessness. Without radical and robust interventions to fix our broken housing system and improve our children, health, education and social protection supports, we will not move towards eliminating homelessness. Over the course of the next 12 to 18 months, prevention measures must take on huge additional importance and dramatic increase in prevention funding is required youth homelessness and children leaving care. An issue of particular importance is young people exiting care settings. An analysis of the 4,705 unique individuals supported by Peter McVerry Trust in 2015 shows that at least 20% of these had a history of under 18s residential care. A specific example of the impact that inadequate aftercare supports for young people leaving care can have on homeless figures is our service at St Catherine's Foyer in Dublin. This service is a supported temporary accommodation service providing homeless accommodation for young people aged 18 to 26. It accommodated 70 young people in 2015, and of those 70 young people, 37 or 52 per cent had a history of under 18's care. Those 37 young people should never end up in adult homeless services. The solution is a robust and effective aftercare programme with ring-fenced, step-down and independent living units for young people exiting care drug-free aftercare services. Another cohort of people who end up accessing homeless services are those who are engaging in drug treatment programmes, be they stabilisation projects or those who have completed residential drug treatment programmes. Individuals who have successfully detoxed or stabilised their drug use find themselves re-entering homelessness and more often than not are being offered emergency accommodation with active drug users. The creation of health-funded stabilisation beds and aftercare beds for these individuals would ensure that they are receiving appropriate accommodation outside of mainstream homeless services. Institutional discharges. One further group becoming homeless as a result of the failings of another government department are those exiting prisons. The committee has heard of persons with <coughs> acute and terminal illnesses being discharged into homelessness from hospital settings. Similarly, far too often people are freed from prison to go directly into our homeless services. These are further examples of one department wiping its hands of the vulnerable and expecting the Minister for Housing to deal with the consequences. The solution is for the responsible departments to fund alternative programmes. For example, the Department of Justice should fund the Housing First model for ex-offenders at risk of homelessness. This programme would provide multidisciplinary supports to ex-prisoners so they can secure accommodation and reintegrate into community and society. Peter McVerry Trust currently runs a small-scale and very successful programme of this nature. Rent Supplement Rent supplement must be increased as a measure to prevent those in private rental accommodation becoming homeless. 
to prevent landlords simply increasing the rents even further. It should be accompanied by legislation linking rents to the consumer price index. An increase in rent supplement is not designed to free up more rental properties. It is designed to keep those on rent supplement in their current accommodation and out of homelessness. Rent supplement has been reduced by an average of 28% since 2007, but rents are now back to or beyond their 2007 levels. Peter McFarry Trust believes that rent supplement must be increased by at least 28%. The department must ask itself whether it will choose to raise rent supplement or will it watch the numbers in homelessness spiral upwards. Mortgage arrears and mortgage to rent. The problem of mortgage arrears is a ticking time bomb. There are currently about 33,000 residential mortgages and about, about 15,000 buy to lets in mortgage arrears of more than two years. The vast majority of these are irrecoverable. Currently, some 18,200 repossession cases are going through the courts. The government need to agree a programme whereby the most distressed mortgages would be purchased by approved housing bodies. The households would then pay what rent they can realistically afford to the AHB, the balance being the rent paid and the cost being borne by the AHB would be paid by the state in the form of a HAP payment. The tenants would have, to, would have a buyback option. The approved housing body would commit to housing the existing household. The government should also introduce legislation preventing the financial institutions and, in the case of travellers, preventing the local authorities from evicting families and individuals into homelessness. Housing. Peter McFerry Trust believes that in order to address the housing emergency, it is imperative that a single overarching national housing policy is developed. The action plan for housing should include recognition of the right to adequate housing and be centred on the principles of affordability, equality and social inclusion. The action plan for housing should also recognise that we have a housing system and not just a housing market. In terms of housing supply, there must be a targeted, evidence-led supply of housing. Supply alone will not deliver reductions in homelessness or help address failures in housing policy. Supply must be designed to meet housing needs of those across society. Housing delivery must be state-led. We believe that the current social housing strategy by which three out of four households on the social housing waiting lists are to be provided with accommodation in the private rented sector through the HAP scheme is both unrealistic and undesirable. Two decades of trying to accommodate low-income families primarily in the private rented sector has been a major contributor to the current crisis. Trying to get out of the crisis by accommodating even more households in the private rented sector seems illogical and given the dire shortage of private rented accommodation available is unrealistic. Furthermore, under the present loosely regulated private rented sector, households have no security of tenure and for families with children, security of tenure while the children are of school going age is of prime consideration. As regards the delivery of new supply, Peter McFerry Trust makes the following recommendations. In order to maximise the use of existing building stock, an urgent audit of compulsory purchase programme of empty private buildings should be initiated. This would allow these units to be returned to active residential use. There must be continuous real-time monitoring and management of our building stock and sites. An example of the empty buildings in Dublin is number 31 Mountjoy Square. It is two doors away from Peter McVary Trust's head office. It is an empty building containing nine one-bedroom apartments. In April 2012, a receiver was appointed to the property. Since then, and more than likely for a period before that date, the property has remained vacant, bar a brief period of it being squatted. This is a prime example of a perfectly good building being held from the market, restricting supply and ultimately increasing homelessness. Modular housing can play a crucial role in delivery of new supply. Local authorities need to deliver an additional 1,000 units of modular housing for individuals, couples and families in homelessness, low-income households, student accommodation and to provide some level of integrated housing and those on the social housing waiting list. A separate, relatively small-scale fund for approved housing bodies to build 500 units of modular housing in Greater Dublin Region would fast-track delivery of these units and buy greater breathing space for local authorities. Any remaining voids should be turned around by approved housing bodies. The question arises in the context of a housing emergency whether local authorities are best placed to use their limited resources to return voids back into use or are they better focusing their attention on new build projects. Peter McVary Trust believes approved housing bodies can quickly and effectively return voids to use, allowing local authorities to get on with the job of building new social and affordable housing. An intensive programme of renovation and restoration should have all appropriate voids inhabited within 12 months. There also needs to be major investment in student housing. 
a rapid building programme involving three to 5,000 units of student accommodation in Dublin, Cork and Galway would immediately lessen pressures on the rental market, freeing up houses and apartments across those cities. Local authorities and third level institutions must immediately meet to begin drafting plans for large scale modular student accommodation on campuses or public lands. Removing students from urban rental markets would significantly lessen pressure on supply and free up housing options. The Housing First model, which focuses on the rapid rehousing of homeless individuals and the provision of intensive wraparound supports, must be rolled out nationally. A rapid rehousing approach must become the standard approach to homelessness across Ireland. In those counties with less than 100 individuals, Housing First is a much more logical and cost effective response rather than the opening of any further homeless shelters. Indeed, in those 21 counties, a rapid rehousing programme could eliminate homelessness quickly, and in the larger centres of homelessness, Housing First can play a critical role in tackling rough sleeping and long term homelessness now and in the months and years to come. Any decommissioned and currently unoccupied bedsits should be listed and analysed by the local authorities together with approved housing bodies. Any units that can be renovated and reconfigured to deliver high quality units of accommodation for single people should be compulsorily purchased or leased on a long term basis. A programme of works should be instigated to be delivered either by the local authority or approved housing bodies and the units used to alleviate the social housing crisis. Finally, a major investment in programme is required in the area of cost rental. A critical development to achieve a functioning rental system, cost rental must be fast-tracked. The cost rental pilot earmarked for 2016 must be ramped up with investment rising from 10 million to 100 million euro and be led by non-profit housing associations, either local authorities or approved housing bodies. The cost rental model should not be reliant on private developers. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Freel, for your uh, presentation. And I suppose, just to put in context, uh, this committee is a short-lived committee due to make recommendations by the middle of June. And uh, thank you for the concise nature of the report, but with specific recommendations. And that's uh, primarily what the committee was looking for. So it's open to colleagues if uh, we have a number of questions. Uh, Deputy Cowan. Uh, thanks very much. And, uh, thanks, gentlemen, for, for coming in. And like you, Chairman, thank the for the concise report and the, the, the clear recommendations uh, within it. That's what this committee is about and that's what the commi this committee would hope to achieve, ultimately having spoken to all stakeholders and everybody associated with this crisis and emergency, that we can make a detailed analysis of the situation and clear, concise recommendations emanating from it for the Minister to implement thereafter. In relation to the CPOs, have you looked at the existing legislation and the ways in which it can be improved? Because many local authorities would say that the powers within it are not sufficient in light of the difficulties that they meet with um, issues of, 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 of uh, property rights and so forth. You know, we need a clear, concise um, indication from, from, from all and sundry that if there's immediate and emergency legislation required in order to give the correct meaningful powers to local authorities for that for that suggestion which is prevalent across the sector to become a reality because it's it, 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 it's twofold it can address the housing situation but in towns and villages around the country it can help the lack of vibrancy that exists in these locations as well where the commercial reality is that the retail industry will not be what it was once before but what's needed in these towns and villages is life is residents, is people living and participating in their communities and also addressing a housing and homelessness situation that we have. So nobody, you know, everybody talks about the CPO and I'm, you know, I, could, I could be accused of the same myself, that it needs to be used uh, for more beneficial purposes. But I'm, I'm hearing uh, local authorities say, for example, that they have difficulties with that and I need you and others to come forward uh, from your perspective. Where are the roadblocks and how can they be surmounted? And then we'd be in a position to ask the Dáil to introduce legislation that can make our, uh, our, our aspirations reality. Thank you, Deputy. If you'd like to hold for one moment, I'll take two or three questions and you might respond to them together. Uh, Deputy O'Sullivan. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like you to give us um, some sense. We all know the work that you do, but if you could just bring it in, in terms of the numbers of people you are working actively with. 
and the kind of accommodation that you are providing and then going on to your capacity to do more and what is stopping your organisation from doing more. For example, the House of Manjai Square, what would it take for you to get that? And if there are other places that you can identify and is it funding or what would prevent you from uh, delivering your service further? Thank you very much. And Deputy Durkin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, to congratulate uh, Peter McVeigh Trust for the tremendous work you have done and the examples you have set over the years. I'm not uh, uh, a great admirer of uh, approved housing bodies, as everybody knows at this stage. And Father McVeigh knows that too, because we've had this conversation many times. Have it again in now. actual fact, uh, just, uh, just, just in passing, I thought I might just refer to it, Mr. Chairman. But uh, I, I, I do want to say this: that that uh, there wouldn't be a need for approved housing bodies if the local authority system had prevailed. <laughs> Unfortunately, what's happening now is the thrust and the weight of the whole housing issue has been thrust upon approved housing bodies, and they're not capable of dealing with that, nor were they ever suited to dealing with it. What they are capable of dealing with very well, as the Peter McVeigh Trust shows, is the, the specialised areas, the, the addiction correction areas, the, the sheltered housing areas, and there's a growing need, as, as we know, uh, for, for, for those particular facilities now and will be for the time ahead and from here on, to a greater extent than we've ever known before. What the problem that's happening now is, on top of that, is falling onto the Peter McVeigh Trust, the responsibility for ordinary general housing. It's not possible to do it that way. And as I said many times before, Chairman, you'll be sitting there in 10 years' time talking about it if we don't revert back to the original system, which I strongly support, of the local authority providing local authority houses and the specialised areas falling into the areas of, of, of that, that, that they do extremely well. Can I just mention very quickly, rent levels, which is correct, Rent levels are now up to what they were in 2007. And we had this discussion with the Property Owners Association just a couple of days ago. Sadly, and unfortunately, as a result of a whole lot of contributory factors, salary and, 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 and incomes are not what they were in 2007, nor are they likely to be for some considerable time. So that, that's an issue that we, we have to address in the affordability issue that's now presenting itself to us and the various proposals that have come forward. Yes, I can do that. Now, I, I, one particular issue that I, I referred to before, Chairman, I want to repeat it. I don't see anything wrong. And I'm not, I'm not a communist or a socialist or even I don't practice no, in either of those two. Well, I, I, I just like to throw it out to you there uh, occasionally. Please. Uh, occasionally, in, in, in order to get a consensus, Chairman. But I do, want to, I do want to say this. I do not see anything wrong at all with the lending institutions that lent so liberally in the boom times, having some social responsibility for picking up the tab. I don't, we're not looking for a write-off. I, I don't wish to look for a write-off. But they can elongate their debts, they can extend the period, and so on. I think it is totally unwrong, or, sorry, totally wrong to, uh, to think that we should find somebody else to pick up the responsibility. And in that context, I'm not in favour of, 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 uh, of approved housing bodies, or any other housing body, picking up the tab at this particular stage. I think there's a certain recognition that has to be borne in mind. There has to be a recognition on the part of the lending institutions, of whom we have all known. We've been in court countless times. We've addressed these issues on a one-to-one -one with the lending institutions, and we've asked the question time and time again, why was it so easy and so, so, so why was it sustainable to lend so liberally in 2007? Because the circumstances haven't changed. The only thing that has changed is the economy has changed all around the people concerned, and they're now finding themselves in an impossible position. So I strongly urge that we consider carefully the need to impart and, and implant in the minds of lending institutions some degree of responsibility and culpability for what happened, because if we allow some other system to replace, to replace what happened, well then uh, we will we'll find ourselves with nobody accepting responsibility. The last point I want to make sure is this. If we, if we divide responsibility amongst a multiplicity of bodies and people in respect of housing, the problem is everybody has responsibility and nobody has responsibility. We have to have one team going through the whole thing and that's simply the local authorities as, 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 as I've often said. And the last point is in relation, I, I, I note the Kildare piece, of which we're well aware uh, in, in, in County Kildare and adjoining counties. It's a really serious issue that's growing on a daily basis. And the, the fact that we don't have the houses now, uh, the local authority is purchasing houses and needs to purchase more. And the houses have been available. And, and they are available, but we need to purchase more. The government has approved the, uh, whatever funds are necessary. But there's no, no embargo on that. 
So I think we need to impress upon all concerned to try to ensure that we, we achieve what we can in the shortest possible time, including the provision of modular housing. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, a number of points you raised uh, aren't direct questions, and they will come up in our deliberations as we try to make recommendations on some of the points you've reiterated before. Um, but there were a number of specific questions in CPO and with uh, the, the, the services. And maybe one you might elaborate, Mr. Freel. You, you referred specifically, and I'd be aware of a lot of the services, but would you elaborate a little, please? You said uh, the Peter McVeary Trust currently runs a small scale and very successful programme. That's in relation to the institution. Um, discharge. You might tell us just a little bit more about that, please, and, and the other questions. Okay. Well, um, if we could, um, if we start with just uh, in relation to the um, compulsory purchase by local authorities, we haven't looked up the legislation, but what we are aware of is is that it uh, hasn't been tested in the courts. So I suppose what we're saying in the trust is that one local authority needs to act as a lead. What we've been asking for is a mapping exercise uh, in, in, in one city, one town, uh, find out what the actual stock is, what is available. Some some landlords will want to do deals. Um, the trust, for example, the Peter McVeigh Trust brought in 39 voids last year. Uh, on behalf of the local authority in Dublin, 39 voids. The average time to turn those voids around for us was 12 to 18 weeks. And for most of those voids, we secured our own resource. So there was no cost to the exchequer on that. Um, so we're saying a similar exercise in the private market and then uh, try to engage with, with landlords and where, 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 where not appropriate or where they won't, then to test it in the court. Somebody needs to test it to see do we need to change. We had the outgoing Minister for Housing saying that there was constitutional issues and there were issues in relation to private property. But we equally had uh, um, um, uh, in the courts people saying it's never been tested, so we should, we should test it. That's number one. In relation to what the Trust does, last night we had 669 people in our care last night. So we had 669 people. 145 of them were, was our housing stock. And like the Deputy from Kildare said, um, we don't, we're not into empire building. We don't want to become a, you know, a, a big uh, approved housing body. We became a housing body, an approved housing body, because the, some of the most vulnerable, most challenging clients of ours couldn't get access to either local authority or to either some of the big housing bodies. So we became one ourselves to give them a key to the door. So 145 people last night had a key to their own front door. They're no longer a client of the Peter McFerry Trust. They're a tenant of the Peter McFerry Trust. So we do as well see the need for specialist providers like ourselves. Um, one of those clients was a client we picked up on Stevens Green and he's in a unit of Merrion Square. Um, and he has a Peter McFerry Trust addiction counsellor, a Peter McFerry Trust psychiatric nurse, and access to a Peter McFerry Trust uh, um, uh, therapist if, if, if he needs it. So it is possible to give the most vulnerable housing. The rest of our beds was we have ch 20 children in care, 19 children in care of the state living with us um, between the ages of 12 and 18. Um, we see absolutely no sense. If they come in at 12 to 18, the state would pay about 500,000 towards their care. And we see no sense in putting them into homelessness. They already have the label of being in care. And to send them towards homeless services is another label and another failure. So what we want to see is them going straight into housing. And again, it's all about housing, access to housing. And we want to, we, we feel that we have 10% of our housing at the moment we've given over to children in care. They need more support or they'll turn into a party. But it doesn't mean they can't be supported, and it doesn't mean they have to end up in homeless services. The rest are primarily, we have 25 drug-free beds for people coming out of treatment, people making the step to go into treatment. They shouldn't also have to go back to homeless hostels and be around people who are, are actively using. And then the project the Chairman mentioned there in, uh, uh, asked us to comment on in relation to the specialist programme we have for people coming out of prison. This is a very low-key programme. We don't talk about it too much. but. There are units, housing units, pepper potted um, around primarily the Dublin city area. Um, and there, we go into the prisons. We know that they're already deemed as homeless. People have stated to uh, social protection and to the chaplaincy service and sometimes to the probation service that they will be ho homeless upon release. 
um, some of them would have done very long sentences and therefore are slightly institutionalised as well. And so their best chance of survival when they come out and not repeating uh, offences is not to go into a hostel you know, and have to be out during the day and all that all the goes with that, but to go into their own housing unit and let the work begin from there. And we have um, 22 people in units around the city. Um, and a year, we give them up to six months, and then we get them into private rented. And I suppose that's why we want to see, uh, and we mentioned in our statement, a rapid build of student accommodation. Uh, we have the highest population of young people in the country are coming from Kildare now. The highest birth rates are coming from Kildare. We run services in, in Kildare. Minute University is soaking up the private rented accommodation in Minute, Selbridge, Leakslip and Clain. At the same time, we have 14 young people in a hostel in Kildare, and I'm just taking that as an example. Um, uh, and you know, all of them are ready for private rent. They're all young, they're all single. The, you know, the, the, the avenue would have always been private rented for them. They can't get near the private rented market. It's all in the university. So whenever planning permissions going forward are given to extensions to universities, it should include modular rapid build um, that can be run on a private-public partnership. It doesn't have to cost the state. Limerick University have a great example of uh, a, a big amounts of uh, um, student accommodation, and we're saying that that would free up the market. It's the same in St. Pat's um, in Drumcondra. We have a lot of, of, of of young people from Dublin Northside need, needing a private rented accommodation. Between St Pat's and DCU, there's nothing to be got in the private rented market out that stretch. It's all gone to student accommodation. So we have, in, in that, just go back to that specialist programme for prisoners, the, primarily the market for them would be the private rented market. We have 22 uh, in our care at the moment. Last year we had 48. The only blockage for us there in taking more of those out of institutions is the move on in private rented. So we want to see a vibrant private rented market again. And the way to do that, one of the ways is, uh, um, is to give greater uh, uh, supports to landlords. And the other way is, is to take some of the other cohorts out. Final point in relation to Deputy Dorkin. Um, we don't want to become uh, uh, the job of the banks, but we know from Ulster Bank this week now, 2,900 uh, distressed uh, um, uh, loans are going to be handed over to, uh, to a, uh, possibly a vulture fund. 900 of them are family homes. We know one of those family homes. Um, they've agreed and offered to pay 1,500 a month to the bank, um, and uh, the bank is saying no. The bank will sell that loan off. Uh, they will write off the loan. Whoever buys that property will probably pay 1800 a month on a mortgage. And we're going to spend $45 million this year in hotel accommodation. So we're saying that whether it's the local authority, I'm not saying the trust would take over 2,900 loans, but we could, as the other deputy said, ramp up. And um, we certainly would like to see us going to about 600 specialist units for vulnerable peoples. Uh, um, but there are other, there's local authorities and there's approved housing bodies. The Minister of, for Housing will shortly announce to, and I'm just finished now, Chairman, the, the Minister for Housing will um, shortly announce two CAS um, um, schemes to buy acquisitions of properties. These loans could be bought and we could keep people in their homes very quickly. And don't forget, they're selling them very cheap as well. So it could be a great save to the state. Would, uh, uh, Father McFerry, yes. Do I have to? I'm on, am I? No, uh, yeah, just back to the compulsory purchase. Uh, I don't know what the local authority's problem is. The National Roads Authority had no difficulty compulsorily purchasing houses and land when it wanted to build motorways, and there was no uh, constitutional problem with that. Uh, so why can't we compulsorily purchase houses for the far more important uh, issue of providing people with, uh, with homes? I absolutely agree with Deputy Durkin on the local authority has to be the primary mover in terms of providing social housing. The housing associations, uh, the approved housing bodies are simply not capable of addressing the scale of the problem. 
we're, we're, we're going to get the housing needs assessment this year. Uh, we're certainly going to be well in excess of 100,000 households on the social housing waiting list. The approved housing bodies have no way of coming anywhere near that. It has to be local authorities. But I believe local authorities don't want to build social housing. I think they don't want to manage social housing, and certainly not large-scale social housing. They are going out to purchase. I have a problem with them purchasing on the open market, uh, though it's necessary. But what they're doing is competing with uh, private uh, buyers, they're pushing the price up, and they're reducing the stock of private housing, uh, which is also an issue. With regard to the banks, again, I agree they, there's a moral argument for the banks taking responsibility, but I don't think the banks are going to respond to moral arguments. Uh, I think what we need is uh, we need to make the mortgage to rent option obligatory. And banks have a responsibility to explain to the courts why that option is not appropriate in any particular case. It seems to me to be the obvious answer. You keep a family in their home, they continue paying a rent, whatever they can afford, to either the local authority or an approved housing body. Uh, secondly, I would like to see legislation uh, preventing anybody, local authorities or uh, banks, uh, from evicting people into homelessness. I don't think young people leaving residential care should be allowed to leave residential care into homelessness. We had one young 18-year-old who was, who was uh, discharged from his residential care on his 18th birthday. It was a Friday afternoon. He had no money in his pocket, and there was no accommodation arranged for him. That should be illegal. It should be illegal for the local authorities to evict travellers from uh, unofficial halting sites until alternative accommodation is available, and it should be illegal for the banks and the vulture funds to evict families into homelessness until alternative of accommodation was available. If the mortgage to rent option and the inability to evict people into homelessness was in place, I think the banks might accept their moral responsibilities. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Count, did you want to finish on the CPO before I go to the thing? Um, I take your point. You know, I was on a council myself for 18 or 19 years. The, the, the laws associated with CPO for land and, and buildings, unfortunately, is not as strong as it would appear as it is for that of the NRA. And that's hence the reason why those need to be strengthened, and hence the reason why it should be incumbent on this committee to seek uh, professional legal advice in this regard. The government has available to it an Attorney General's office. The departments, you know, I remember being on, a, on the council when you were doing a county development plan. The, you know, the executive had expertise at their disposal, but the views and the opinions of the members, which might be contrary to that, did not have the relevant expertise at their disposal in order to enact the sort of uh, content in a development plan which they aspire to. And I think that's a fault that we have to rectify in this committee, that we have to analyse that CPO legislation, and we have to make firm and forceful recommendations that the Dáil can enact in an emergency situation in order to address the, the, the seriousness and the immediacy of the problem and to have the sort of powers that is available to the likes of the NRA when they can compulsory purchase uh, land and dwellings in order to provide a, a, a pivotal infrastructure such as, such as roads to affect the sort of transport and the, and, and, and the connectivity that we've seen over the last number of years. But um, you know, I would ask the Chair and the Committee to respectfully consider uh, the seeking of professional legal advice to advise on this issue and also in the, in the area of the likes of mortgage to rent. You know, again, you know, during the course of, the, 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 the course of legislation um, in the last doll, there was an opinion amongst the majority of the opposition that the, the bank veto that remained in place you know, has put us in the situation we are now, and they eventually relaxed that towards the end of the last doll. Court rules meant that it was even slower coming into being and we now see the result of all that and the, and the terrible calamity that is facing many people. And again, this committee, you know, with the relevant expertise available to it, can make specific recommendations to amend the governing legislation that, 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 that governs mortgage to rent to ensure that, that the courts are given the capacity, as, 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 as the Father McFerry has said, to, to instruct a resolution because even, even the new rules in recent times, we had another witnesses in here recently, where the bank veto was called into question and the courts asked, asked uh, to, to, to adjudicate. In 11 cases, eight of them found in favour of the debtor. 
which in itself proves the very point that that legislation, unfortunately, was flawed. That legislation, unfortunately, could have been so much better if there was adequate scrutiny and adequate debate and adequate information and adequate proposals allowed to be inserted in the legislation at the time. With the configuration of the doll now is such that that sort of open and frank debate can take place and ultimately the doll will instruct government to act accordingly. But the doll needs available to it and this committee too, especially in this instance, needs relevant professional legal advice to be able to make proper and effective recommendations to the door, which in turn will instruct the government. Thank you, Deputy. I'd just like to remind you that on the 10th of May, we had the Master of the High Court. Uh, uh, no, no, but I, I just, on no, this. I just want to make the specific. To, that's not specific recommendations no. being made by well, a committee I'll or seeking myself, advice. It was that, no, that they're merely given their their opinion as to what is taking place. They can do no more, they're not obliged to do more. But we as legislators are obliged to make recommendations to the Dáil in terms of the government for which we have been elected to do. And I am saying as a member of that, I am not getting sufficient information or advice in relation to the CPO legislation for me to recommend change. Whereas the government have at their disposal an Attorney General's office and staff. I just make the point that at those meetings, that issue of CPO and their advice was sought. That might not be sufficient, but this meeting shouldn't be taken in isolation fr from that. That's all I want to say at this point. Do you needn't comment on that. That's a matter that we'll have to deal with as a committee. And I, I'm not. The, CPOs, the big issue in relation to CPOs, and I, I agree with the deputy, but in a lot of the towns, they're listed buildings. And it's about developers going in or whoever's going in to buy and, and develop them into housing. Is it, a listed building is a no-brainer for a developer or anybody or a local authority to go in and develop them. If we are going to change the legislation, we need to look at relation to that as well. Bear, the, that's, a, that's a discussion we'll have for a separate... I, the, the point De Deputy Cowan was in, indicating was that the committee may need independent legal advice on the constitutionality of it, and I accept that point, but I'm just making the point to the committee that this is an issue that has to be taken with a previous meeting where other legal people gave it an, an opinion as well. But I do want to continue with the witnesses, and I have a number of people presenting... De Deputy Harty, please. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, to what extent does mental illness contribute to homelessness as, as a primary cause of, of homelessness? And what effect does homelessness have on precipitating mental illness? Because it's a, it's a huge, I, I would expect it is a huge problem. And the second question is, do you see a role for a, a rural resettlement scheme where people who would voluntarily opt to move out of urban areas where there's a huge amount of homelessness and housing shortages and move to a, a rural area where they would have a, a, a greater um, acceptance in the community, they would fit into the community, they would be welcomed in the community, they would be an addition to the community and perhaps have a better quality of life? Thank you. Deputy Butler. Thanks, Cahirdoch, and thanks to yourselves for coming in. And we all know the work that um, the Father P Peter McFerry Trust does all over the country. And I would like to compliment you on your work. I noticed from this uh, spreadsheet you sent out that 60% um, um, that, you, uh, that you work with um, need support in relation to mental health and 81% in relation to support with drug use. So the question I have for you, a couple of direct questions is, firstly, how are you funded? And like all organisations, I'm sure you could use a lot more money. The second question is in relation to, you said that you think that rent supplements should be increased to 28%. And I'm just wondering, do you feel that that would uh, have a knock-on effect, that it would end up driving up rents? And the third question is in relation to the housing first model. Um, you know, I'm from, uh, um, from Waterford constituency, so it is urban and rural, and you were saying that there's 21 um, counties um, around Ireland that would have less than 100 um, homeless, and I can relate to that. And I'm just wondering if you would touch a little bit more on that, because that seems like a very good idea to try and stop it there before it gets any worse. Thank you. And Deputy Dowd? Um, I'd just like to welcome the Trust as well. I'm a great admirer of, of the work that you do and the clarity and the points that you made here today. 
Um, I would agree uh, with, with the point of the committee at, the, at that debate that we had from the Master of the High Court. I think the summary of what he said was there is nothing if the government so decides in public interest if they wish to do in terms of homes that can't be done. I agree with Deputy uh, Cowan about legal advice and I, I think he actually said that. But if we put it in as a recommendation, we're all going to stand behind that because that's, that's what has to happen. Uh, I just want to agree with you in terms of the travelling uh, community. I think it's appalling what is happening. I think it's appalling that some counties are refusing to spend any money at all, in the, certainly in the last three years, on, on, on travel accommodation. Uh, and I think that it's a huge issue and it's happened in my own county and I think I very much regret that happening and I think we should change the law that they should not be moved unless there's a better place for them to go to that meets greater meets their needs. Uh, the one point that I find in my own uh, community, I'm meeting an increasing number of middle-aged males who have separated from their families and they actually have nowhere to go and they live in very poor accommodation. Now some of them would have, uh, they would have obviously family issues and some of them may have alcohol problems. I'm not judgmental but I'm saying there are, there's a huge cohort there. Now they have a very low priority because they quote unquote they have no partners or they have no children. But in actual fact many of them want to keep in touch with their, with, with maybe their spouse or certainly their children. And, and I, I just think, I don't know if you've uh, thought on that as to how it is a separate special court that we need to address. And the other point that constantly concerns me is that uh, there's a huge number of people who come to politicians about their homelessness or about their need for housing. Now, the local authorities don't have the capacity because of the numbers to articulate or to advocate. We need advocates for people in our towns and our cities who are in need of, of, of housing. And I'm not talking about politicians. I'm talking about professional assessment as to what their needs are, what their medical needs are, what their social needs are, and all of that. We need a much more integrated approach. So what I'm saying is that I think we need a far more uh, professional uh, service to people who are presently looking for housing. I don't know, would you have a view on that? or? I think that's very, very important because I end up trying to, you end up, you know, you don't want to go into personal details of people, but you say, look, if you have a medical issue, please get your doctor to write, not to me, but to the council about it. You know, the, the, the totality of the, of, the, of the individual or the family uh, is often not articulated, and I think the local authority is, is not best placed to understand it because of pressure. Uh, and the last point I want to make is, um, I met, excuse me, earlier this morning, if we have 200,000 vacant premises in the state, right, uh, now the government uh, say they want to get 70,000 of those into, into the rental sector. Now it seems to me that, that we must encourage that, now, and I don't have a problem with a, a penalty if you don't, but I think we need, and I think you did say, an incentive if they do. And I think that if we can, if we can encourage people who have empty houses to get into the HAP and sign a five-year lease and all of those issues, that would that be pushing an open door? Because you can release those houses or get them into, into, in, into people who need them straight away and then in four or five years' time hopefully we'll have ramped up the housing construction programme so they can have a permanent home as her if they wish. I don't know if you have, have a view on that. Thank you, Deputy O'Dowd. Father McFerry, Mr Doyle, if you want to answer that sequence and then I'll take the final series of questions. So. Uh, I'll start and then Peter will come in. Just to say that 60% uh, of our client group every year, last year it was f um, over 4,700 individuals came through the trust and over 60% of them either had a, a, a diagnosed mental health or were displaying or asked for support around the mental health issue. So the, the, the issue between addiction and mental health is huge. 80% of our client group last year had an addiction, uh, some form of addiction issue. And um, we have a, a residential detox centre in Denal, County Dublin, and 84 brave people went through that last year. And for some of them, um, their mental health issues came out of their addiction. And for some of them, when they detoxed, their mental health issue increased. So they were medicating their mental health through uh, uh, substances. So, but the issue of mental health uh, is huge. The issue of going through institutions and going through homeless services has an impact on your mental health. Uh, we housed a young man five weeks ago um, in the unit and I, we were having a fundraiser and I'll touch on the funding in a minute, uh, 14 million, 9 million from the state, 
we raise five million. And one of the things we have to do to raise the five million is sell our soul on a daily basis. And one of those days, I was bringing a group of solicitors around to, to see one of our housing units, and we met this homeless man who had just been given the key to the door a couple of weeks beforehand. And when we asked him, how did he feel? And one of the solicitors asked him, how do you feel about having your own house? He said, he still can't believe it. Still, still can't believe it. And, then, and your second feeling, I don't feel I deserve it. So, despite of what people say about people putting people into hotels and people are just looking for housing, most of our homeless people have, uh, their self-esteem has been damaged and that affects their mental health. And although that lad is no longer a, a client to the trust, he's a tenant, he still doesn't feel he deserves it. He's seen a lot of his colleagues passed away. We buried 13 of our, our clients last year and we've buried nine this year already and we're not yet halfway into the year. So the issue of mental health is huge, the issue of addiction is huge, and the whole damage that being in services does to people is uh, uh, um, huge on individuals. 14 million is our budget, as I said. Five we have to raise. If any is cycle, you can cycle to Wexford with us on the 17th of September. I'll be cycling myself, and Peter will be firing the gun. So we do all sorts of things. The public are very good. They're particularly very good in relation to capital. Most of our donors don't feel they have a responsibility to fund staff. They think that should be the job of the state, but they're quite happy to su support capital development. And one of the initiatives we have about uh, unlocking the private, um, it's like the local authorities. If you go into any of the local authority offices, the planning department is generally bigger than the housing department. A an awful lot of local authorities have to do major refurbishment work on the housing department now because it's bigger now than the planning issue. And most of them have security, unfortunately, on them as well. You can always identify where the housing department is now because it's generally a security person outside managing stressful individuals. Um, and that's what it is, is stress. But on, on that, w we have been able to get a number of landlords in the private sector to hand over the properties to the trust because what, what they find is that they, they've no bother rent but they, they're, they're worried about the mental health or they're worried about the addiction. And so there's a role to play there for local authorities in not just building up their housing staff and their planning staff, but building up their social work staff. Most local authorities, if you go down to Leash, uh, I think uh, they may have one, if not two, social workers in the whole of the county. So. We, we should be building up disposed social supports and that way, as Peter has said, the local authorities could, and I think that's part of the resisting and building, it's not the building, it's, it's the managing the individuals in the stock then. So we should build up the social work departments and local authorities and then also the voluntary housing associations, particularly the specialists, have a role in linking with private landlords. We have had a number of very successful um, uh, uh, cases where landlords have handed over the tenancies to the trust and we've become the landlord for the client. As long as they're getting the, the monthly rent, they're quite happy. Um, Peter was going to answer some of the rest. Yeah, I think we deal with a, a very uh, specific subgroup of the homeless w with addiction and mental health problems primarily, but I think we have to remember that 95% of those who are becoming homeless today have only one problem. They don't have the money to pay their rent. Or the banks have taken the property from, from under them. They don't have any mental health problems. However, if you're homeless for a long time or for any substantial, you're going to become depressed. Depression is a common uh, feature of people who are homeless. Depression is a common common feature of the families who are in hotels. Your self-esteem hits rock bottom. Parents will tell me that they feel they have failed their children. They feel they're bad parents. Uh, and the public perception of homeless people is, if you're homeless, there must be something wrong with you. And so people who become homeless for absolutely very valid reasons, they, they feel that perception. I, I, I heard the story of one family that were living in an hotel uh, bedroom.